Welcome back to 340 Paddler. Today I want to talk about approaching a ramp. Now, you may be thinking, well, that's pretty easy. That's kind of the second thing that I learned to do in a kayak after paddling. Well, it usually would be, but on the Missouri River, we have a lot more current and a lot more things going on. So I want to do this primer because every year on the race, I see people sink, capsize, run into trouble at the ramps, and I want to limit that to some degree. Now, we usually think of the ramps as fairly easy and straightforward. How difficult is it? You paddle up to a literal ramp, and people catch the boat and pull it out of the water, but it can be a little more complicated than that. And the advice I'm giving applies to pretty much an average to low water year. These are the years when you're going to run into more issues at the ramps. In high water years, the issues are actually different because you have more flow and less wing dikes. If that turns out to be the case one year, I will go ahead and do a new video on approaching the ramps in high water. So we're going to start with most ramps. This is leaving aside Washington, Coopers, and Jeff City, which are a little bit unusual and we will deal with later. By the way, please do not park perpendicular to the ramp as it tends to block the ramp for other racers. So oftentimes you will see something like this. This is actually Cooper's Landing, but it does illustrate the point that I'm trying to get to. Usually at a ramp, there's going to be a wing dike, which we see right here, and then you're going to see an eddy coming off of the wing dike. And that's important because the river is flowing along here quite happily. When it hits that eddy, some of the water is actually swirling around the back of the wing dike, like so. And we're going to want to take advantage of that, but also be well aware of that so that we avoid issues. So, on the Missouri River, what we generally see is the ramp is pointed downriver. And usually there's going to be a wing dike on the upriver side. The purpose of that is, of course, to block the flow so we don't get erosion on the ramp and maybe build up a sandbar on this side eventually that'll add to it. Some of the ramps, actually many of the ramps, this wing dike is actually part of the ramp. So you'll see the ramp sort of do that. Uh, whereas here it's spaced off a little bit. It depends where you are. And my yellow form at the top, that is your boat. So when you come into these ramps, what you're going to want to do is generally see the ramp and just beeline it for the end of that wing dike or straight for the ramp. The problem is the wing dike usually has submerged rocks at the end, so you want to be careful of those. What you actually want to do is come around wide. So you're going to come well around the wing dike, giving it a lot of space. And then as you cross that eddy line, which would be in this example right about here, you want to start turning and coming around into the ramp. You do not want to find your boat like this, because if you do, you've got half the boat in the current and half the boat in the eddy. What's going to happen is you're going to capsize, or you're going to scare the living bejesus out of yourself when you almost capsize. So be careful of that. Make sure you take that turn very wide. Now, there are a few exceptions, as I said. For example, there's Washington. And what you need to understand about Washington is, unlike many of the ramps, there is no wing dike blocking Washington, and the current, the channel, is actually on the same side as the ramp. So when you land, you're coming straight out of the current, and when you leave, you're actually launching straight into the current. So right here, as I come around that corner, I'm in the current and I'm floating at two and a half or three miles an hour already downstream. So this changes things at Washington. Washington looks roughly like this. There are some wing dikes downriver. But then here is the shore, the riprap, that runs along the river all the way to the bridge and beyond. 
So as you come in, you won't have to worry about this wing dike much, but because you're in the channel, you really have one shot at the ramp, and you want to land on that near side of the ramp as you approach Washington. This way, if you get into trouble, you have plenty of space to recover before you are going downriver. The problem you're going to run into, and I see this on a regular basis, is people will land over on this side of the ramp. And what happens is they lose control, they capsize, whatever else happens, and now someone is trying to rescue them right here, trying to stop them without their boat floating downriver with nothing uh, to stop them. So you want to be careful, you want to land on the near side, and you want to take Washington fairly quickly. This is not a ramp where you want to meander in because your boat, as you're coming in, is actually floating this way. So what you want to do is come in as quickly as you safely can into the ramp. If you have a plastic boat, an aluminum canoe, etc., I would recommend just plowing in and beaching it. If you have something like a carbon fiber boat, etc., get in as quickly as you can. Hopefully you can have ground crew catch you or you're in a surf ski where you can drop your feet out and as soon as your feet hit the bottom you're standing up grabbing the boat you want to get out of that current then we have Coopers and Jeff City here the issue is different here the issue is that that wing dike is much larger than what you're used to at every other ramp for example Coopers the wing dike is actually considerably longer than the ramp itself. So what you need to do here is you need to come out and then into the bay which is Cooper's Landing and come up. Now the other thing you have to watch for is of course their submerged rocks. They're at the end of the wing dike and I talked about this before but at Jefferson City and Cooper's they're particularly problematic. So here you're going to want to cut extremely wide around that wing dike. Make sure you come nowhere as close to it because it does continue underwater. Otherwise you will do this. This is what I did in 2016 to my Stellar 18S. It now has a giant carbon fiber panel on it. If you ever wonder why, a 30 inch gash with a 14 by 3 inch whacking great hole in the side sufficient enough to sink the boat by the time I made it to the ramp. This is why. I hit a rock at the end of the wing dike. I was probably a good eight feet from the visible wing dike, but there was a rock there close enough to the surface to do this. So, always swing wide and once you're in that eddy, come on back up. This is all either in an eddy or fairly still flat water. So you aren't going to have a problem paddling against the river once you're behind that wing dike. If it all works, we all get to the finish line. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, quarrels, qualms, quandaries, curse words, please leave them in the comments below. Otherwise, this is 340 Paddler hoping that you keep your paddle in the water. This video brought to you by the South Dakota Kayak Challenge. Have you ever sat around and thought, you know what? I really want to sell my soul. Well, come to South Dakota. We'll teach you how. After all, there's nothing else up here to do. Here we have Corey demonstrating the appropriate technique. He was praying for hair and he received hair and it made him happy. Yes, that's Corey's happy face. So if you want to sell your soul, come to South Dakota and while you're there, race in the South Dakota Kayak Challenge. Registration opens. January 1st.